All right, here we go. Today we have former NBA referee Tim Donaghy, who was busted in 2007 by the FBI for betting on his own games. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks for having me. Okay, it's your first time here, and I've, I've heard about you for years. I saw the 60 Minutes uh, special as well as some of the other interviews, and you wrote a book uh, as well. But I want to get into your whole story. So you were born uh, outside of Philly? Yes, Havertown, Pennsylvania. Okay, and your dad was actually a referee himself. Right, he was a top college referee for probably 25, 30 years. Okay, did that have a lot of influence on you? Were you going to the games with him and watching your dad on the court? Definitely. When I was younger, I used to always go to the games with him down at the Palester in Philadelphia or even, you know, down to D.C. or Virginia. Um, you know, I would always travel with him on the weekends. Was it always in the plans to be a referee yourself? No. I got out of uh, college and I had a job and I didn't like what I was doing. I had another job. I didn't like what I was doing. And then um, my mom suggested that I start refereeing and pursue a career as an NBA referee. And I thought, what the heck? There was a lot of people from our area who did it and they were successful. So I put the plan in place and started to officiate and, and try to contact the NBA and see if they had any type of training program I could get in. Okay, because you graduated from Villanova, and um, originally you were you were doing more. Uh, you know, was it college college level uh, refereeing? Not quite college level, but uh, high school and uh, a league called the CBA, which was the minor leagues of the NBA. Got it. So, how do you transition from the minor leagues into the big leagues in the NBA? You know, you're in a training program with the NBA. They're following you around to games that you're officiating in the CBA and flying you out to summer leagues um, to officiate the draft picks of the NBA in the summer and just training you and, and programming you into doing things that uh, how they want you to do it on the floor. And, you know, there's probably about 20 people uh, that go out to the summer camps. And uh, I did it for three or four years and then eventually did the preseason uh of the NBA and wasn't hired that year. And the next year I did the preseason and I was eventually hired. Okay. This was 1994. Correct. Okay. You were 27 years old at the time. 26. 26. Got it. How did it feel, uh, you know, to see your dad do this for a living, you know, to go through the whole CBA and, and actually make it to a level higher than your dad, you know, to the absolute highest level of refereeing? You know, greatest feeling in the world. You know, you set out to uh, pursue something that was tough to do and you worked hard and um, it was a long road to get there where you weren't making a lot of money. And eventually when you finally get that call that they're going to hire you, it's, you know, the greatest feeling in the world. Okay. And you were making about 300000 a year as an NBA ref? Uh, by the time I was done, yes. Okay. So it's like a, a gradual scale where you kind of move up? Right. I think when I first started, it was 80 grand a year with a $25,000 playoff bonus and whatever money you had made off your airlines by, you know, downgrading your first class tickets and flying coach. So, you know, probably about 150 grand the first year and well over 300, uh, you know, my last year. Okay. I mean, what changed in your life when you first became an NBA ref? Because you weren't making 150,000 a year in the CBA. No, um, definitely not. I mean, everything changed. You know, you, you go from, you know, wondering how you're going to pay your bills every month to having plenty of money and, and buying whatever you wanted to buy. Okay. So now you're an official MBA ref and the next year you get married. Right. You end up having four daughters. Yes. Okay. So what were the first few years like as a ref? You know, they were, they were difficult because you're uh, basically the young guy on the staff. A lot of uh, the players and coaches are yelling at you. Uh, they didn't yell at the ref veteran referees. They yelled at uh, the new guy. So it was tough, and you had to really hold your ground and, um, you know, stick to everything that you did and, and not allow them to intimidate you. So, you know, the first couple of years were definitely difficult, but as you, uh, you know, got a lot of experience, you were accepted, and it became a little bit easier each game. Okay. And in the NBA, the refs have like a like a ranking or a score kind of associated with them? Yeah. They, they When I was here, I think there was 54 of us, and they rank you 1 through 54 to 
um, you know, evaluate you to see who does the playoffs and who basically moves up the ladder each year. Okay. And where were you ranking wise in the beginning? Uh, down at the bottom. The, the younger guys are always rated down at the bottom. So it's a thing where you have to gain a lot of experience and work your way up and become accepted and prove that you can do the job. Okay. So, I mean, during your whole career, you did 772 regular season games and 20 playoff games. Uh, at what point did you get to do a playoff game? I believe it was in my ninth year that I did my first playoff game. What year was that around? Uh, well, I guess I started in 94, so, you know, 2002, 2003. Okay, so how did it feel to get to the point where you're so good at your job that they're promoting you to playoff games? You know, just like when you get the call that you're hired, you know, you get the call that you're going to do your first playoff game and it's, uh, you know, joy that you know that you're doing well, you're moving up the ladder and that you're accepted not only by uh, the players and coaches, but by the league office who is monitoring every move you basically make. I mean, during the time of you being a ref, did you see other refs ever getting fired or, you know, let go or anything else like that? Yeah, there were. There was maybe one guy that would get let go each year, uh, whether it was a veteran that, uh, you know, was in the league for 15 years that uh, wasn't progressing the way they thought or a younger guy that didn't move up, uh, you know, like they thought he should have progressed early on. So there was always three or four guys that were on probation each year and maybe one was let go each year. I mean, did you know of any other refs that were let go for wrongdoing, doing something underhanded or anything else like that? No, nothing like that. It was all just based on performance or they gave them an early retirement and, uh, you know, kind of phased them out. Okay, so the same year that you get to do the playoffs, during the regular season, there was a situation with Rashid Wallace. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. How could I forget? Okay. Okay, so tell me about that whole situation. Uh, it was a situation where I was refereeing a game with Steve Javi and Scott Wall, and uh, I think Portland was winning probably by about 20 points, and Rashid probably had about 30 points. Scott Wall called a foul on him that, he didn't like, and as Scott Wall went to report it, he kind of threw the ball at his back and it hit his back, and Scott didn't know, you know, what had happened, and I saw what happened. I felt like Rashid did it on purpose, and I gave him a technical foul, and, uh, you know, he didn't like that, and he was furious with me. I had given him a lot of technical fouls prior to that, and after the game was over, he waited out in the parking lot for me. We parked our car right in the back where the players went in and out of, and he waited for me, and when I came out, he wanted to fight me. Okay, so what exactly did he say to you? He said something along the lines that, you know, he was going to get his money back for that bullshit technical foul I called on him. And, uh, you know, I, I said something back to him, uh, I think along the lines of you fucking deserved it, which was a big mistake because that kind of set him off. And he just came at me and, and wanted to fight me, and, and, you know, if it wasn't for about three security guards and Brevin Knight pulling him back, he probably would have got to me. Oh, so he actually tried to put his hands on you? For sure, yep. Well, okay, when he said that I'm going to get my money back, what happens when someone gets a technical foul? At that time, I think they were fined $500 or $1,000 per technical foul. So it would come out of their you know, paycheck. And you know, a lot of the players didn't like that if they felt like they didn't deserve it. So uh, you know, it would always be about the money. Well, but I mean, Rasheed Wallace was a star player. Five hundred or a thousand dollars really has—that's like a dollar, you know, to you and I. Like, right, but I think deal? I think at that point, as you progress and you get a certain amount of technical fouls, you get suspended for a game. And I think he was getting close to that, so you know, not missing a paycheck for a game could be you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for somebody like him. Well, right, but because of that. He actually, well, because of the confrontation, he got suspended for seven games. I think it was more than that, but I thought it was 10 games. But he, he did get suspended for a uh, you know, long period of time, and it cost him you know, a lot of money. Well, this was the longest suspension that was issued by the league for an incident not involving violence or drugs. Right. Did you find that just a little bit odd? No, because he had been a problem in the past for a lot of people and uh, was getting thrown out of a lot of games and was a headache for the league office. So I think they were just kind of waiting for a situation where, uh, you know, they could 
you know, suspend him for a long period of time and try to, you know, get him to conform to what they wanted him to do. And, and that was to, you know, keep quiet and just play the game. After that situation, did you ever run into him again? No. Well, did you ever well, I, the I, game that he was You know, I, I shouldn't say that. I did run into him again. I actually had his first, I thought you meant off the floor, but I had his first game. No, on, on the floor. Yeah, I had his first game back from that suspension, believe it or not, in Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, he started with me again uh, early in the first quarter, and I had to give him a technical foul. And with that, Scotty Pippen came off the bench at the first time out and said we were taking bets in the locker room to see how long it was going to take to see you give him a technical foul when we found out you were officiating. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, in terms of players – threatening refs how often does that happen have you heard of other situations like this yeah I mean, it definitely has happened before i know alan iverson had threatened steve javi and you know on the court it's a, a heated situation to where you know i'm sure players have said to a lot of referees things that they regret okay so we're talking about 2003 right now so i, I want to get kind of a, a reference point because before you started betting on NBA games, you started betting at country clubs, card games, and other sports games. So when did the actual gambling start with you? I think it started right when I started to join country clubs after I got hired by the NBA, playing in golf matches and playing in card games in the locker room afterwards, and then getting in the car and running down to Atlantic City, which was only about an hour and 15 minutes away from where we lived. I think that's where it all kind of started to snowball for me. I mean, did you feel you had a gambling problem early on? Not early on. I think uh, eventually it got to that point where I was just consumed with betting on everything, whether it was golf, cards, um, football, baseball, anything really, just to, uh, you know, place a bet and watch it on TV. Okay. And it was that year in 2003 that you actually started betting on NBA games. Uh, yes, right around that time, I think. When it comes to betting on sports games, it's not about necessarily who wins or loses. It's about the spread. Right. Right? So explain to everyone what the spread is. Well, the spread's a number that the Vegas uh, odds makers puts on a game uh, to determine who they feel would win by a certain amount of points. So if the Sixers were playing Boston and they felt that Philly was the better team, they would take 10 points off of their total score and give it to Boston and you would have to pick between those two teams who you think would win the game based on that spread being involved. I mean, based on what you know about the game, how accurate is the spread most of the times? Very accurate. You know, it's, it's amazing accurate. how, okay. you know, in any sport, the odds makers in, in Vegas are very good at, at putting a number on a game that is very accurate. Okay, so tell me about the first bet that you placed on an NBA game. Uh, the first time I placed a bet on an NBA game was I was at home and I was um, looking at the Philadelphia Daily News and, you know, every day I would look at the lines and the spreads and I also looked at the referee's master schedule of who was officiating games that day and then I went over to the country club to play golf and my buddy asked me to give him a couple plays in the NBA that night and I rattled off three games to him and, you know, they all won and the next day he called me up and asked me if it was that easy and I said it was based on who was officiating the games. So based on the general public, is 70 to 80%, is that just an obscenely high number in terms of winning? Incredibly high. The, the, if you can win 57 to 58% of the time, that's considered good in the gambling world. So when we were winning at 70 to 80% of the time, that was uh, an insane uh, amount of uh, you know, percentage to, to pick games. Okay. Because most of the games that you bet on were games that you were a referee in, right? Uh, not in the beginning, uh, they weren't, but it eventually spilled into that when I would be in the um, lunchroom or locker room or pregame meeting and know that certain things were going to be done in that game that night and certain teams were going to be put at an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, I would spill that information over to the people that I was gambling with and started to bet on games that I officiated. Okay, because when people hear your story, they assume that you being the ref, you're going to be officiating in a way that's going to help you win a bet. 
But based on the FBI going through all the records, as well as an NBA internal investigation, they both confirmed that you never actually made bad calls in order to help you win bets. No, I didn't do that. But what I did do was I knew what the league wanted the officials to call that night, and it would put a team or a player at an advantage or a disadvantage. And then I would look at the line and see with that advantage, disadvantage, that that line was three, four, or five points off. And that's how I was able to pick the game so well. I mean, it's the equivalent of like insider trading. You to know, a certain the degree, stock market, right? you know, my, the, the, I was always making correct calls, but, you know, I knew what correct calls to make pretty much that we're going to put it, uh, the crew was making that we're going to put a team at advantage or a disadvantage. Okay. And, and this is sort of an interesting topic because, and you mentioned this, I think on 60 Minutes, like, you know, at one point, well, I mean, the entire time, but specifically at certain times, the NBA was favoring Kobe. So, what kind of message would they tell the refs in terms of, you know, make sure you call every foul and make sure that he's always, you know, you know, there to, to shoot extra points and so forth? You know, like, like how, how clear was the, was the message coming from the NBA to the refs? It was very clear. I'll never forget when Kobe was in a playoff series with the Phoenix Suns. And I forget who the uh, defender was, but they called him the Kobe stopper or he referred to himself as the Kobe stopper. And they would show us video of games previously of plays that fouls weren't called of this guy holding him or defending him too strongly. And they wanted freedom of movement because they wanted higher scoring in these games. So they would show you plays and say, this was a foul that was missed. And these three referees missed this play. Make sure you don't let this happen tonight. Make sure you call this when this happens. And that's how they would tr program and train the officials in the next game to have more freedom of movement and have Kobe Bryant uh, have the ability to score more points and, and do well. So they're basically telling you to give Kobe an advantage and people that were covering him a disadvantage in a way. Exactly. I, I now I remember the guy's name. His name was Raja Bell, a uh, very good defender in the league and you know a guy that uh, would defend Kobe very well. And they would just show you a lot of plays of him defensively and saying these plays should have been called a foul and they weren't. And these referees had a low score officiating wise because they missed this call. So make sure you call it tonight. And you as an official wanted to get the highest grade possible because that would mean you would advance up the ladder and have more playoff games and make more money. So you would go out and call it. I mean, did that sort of bother you in a way? Because, I mean, this is sort of point fixing to a certain degree, if you really think about it. You're coming from, you know, the top of the NBA. Did it bother me? No, because, you know, you wanted to do the best job you could do and you were going to go out and do what any employer would tell you to do. And you wanted to progress up that ladder and, and be one of those officials that refereed the NBA finals. So you went out and did whatever they told you to do. And in their mind, they were telling you it's what's good for the game because it's going to open this up. Nobody wants to come to an NBA arena and see a, a game of 85 to 80. They want to see a, a flow of it going up and down the floor, lots of points being scored. And a guy like Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or one of the stars in the NBA, you know, putting in 35 points and flying up and down the floor. Okay. And you ended up betting on Kobe a lot because of the information that, you know, the NBA was telling you and you ended up winning a lot of money because of that. Yeah. There was a situation where I was in the locker room and one of the group supervisors had told us that Phil Jackson had sent in a uh, DVD of several plays of Kobe going to the basket and getting fouled and the officials missing it. And the league office admitted to him that there was some mistakes there and, you know, let's not miss anything against Kobe tonight. And I knew, you know, he was going to do well that night. And I knew that message was going to go on for the next few games until things got straightened out. So I had told the people to you know, bet the Lakers the next couple nights. So uh, let's talk about Allen Iverson for a second. So uh, when he came to Allen Iverson, at one point he actually threatened a referee. Yes. Uh, tell me about that situation. Uh, Iverson had had some history with Steve Javi, and they had had some issues going back and forth the last couple games he had officiated. And uh, the last game, Iverson had threatened Javi that he was going to kill him. And, you know, we as an officiating staff felt that Iverson should have been suspended 
they didn't suspend him. They just fined him. So I had the next game uh, that he was playing in, and the three of us, when we officiated that game, uh, came to the conclusion that we were going to kind of stick it to him by calling palming violations on him, something that he did every night uh, and was let go. So we went out, and each of us had called a palming violation on him that night. And, you know, he was smart enough that he got the message in. He came up to me during a free throw and asked me how long it was going to last for. He kind of knew he was going to, you know, have some issues moving forward. And I told him I had no idea what he was talking about and kind of looked at him and laughed. And he laughed and he just shook his head like, yeah, right. He was smart enough to know what was going on. Well, right. He got fined 25000 but But you felt, well, you and the other refs felt that he should have been suspended. Right. Which he was not because at the time, I guess he was he was a superstar player. Right. right. In the NBA, and they guess they didn't want to suspend him. Palming, is that something that's really called during games very often? No, it's not. Um, it can be, and it's clearly done, um, but it's something that, you know, you let go because it's a exciting crossover move that a lot of the guys use, but it is a violation, and you can call it if you want. And if you have a guy that's been a pain in the ass to you and you want to stick it to him, you can call it, but, you know, most of the time it's, it's let go, and that night, we decided that we were going to stick it to him and call it. Well, right. On top of all the palming uh, fouls, you were letting other players uh, foul him and you weren't calling it on them. Right. there, When he would go to the basket, there were times when, you know, he would get nudged and you would usually call a foul even if the uh, basket went in. But we were letting all that little stuff go and kind of letting him get roughed up a little bit. Well, I guess at one point, uh, one of the NBA supervisors uh, talked to you and said uh, that they felt that Iverson got the message. Yeah, he came in at halftime kind of laughing a little bit, and he goes, yeah, I, I can assure you he's getting the message. Can you say who that was? Yeah, that was Jim Wishmeyer, a guy that lived in, in Denver who was a group supervisor um, for the NBA, and you know he kind of came in laughing at halftime. Uh, he knew what we were doing, and, and it was something that, you know— uh, he felt was kind of funny. Well, right, because Iverson lost that particular game and you bet against him and you won your bet. Correct. So that was an example of you actually having bad calls, which resulted in you winning a bet that you placed against a, t a game that you actually were officiating it. Right. Okay. Was that the only time you did that? Um that we kind of stuck it to a player as a crew. Um, you know, there was other times where, you know, we went out in games and we bet um, who would give Rashid Wallace a technical foul uh, the quickest or, you know, a, a, another player that was giving us a hard time. So, um, you know, I guess you can c consider that, uh, you know, a time where I went out on the floor with a, a pre-notion to do something. I mean, when it came to betting on games, did you base it mostly on the relationship between the refs and certain players, or were other things more important than that? I think that was a, a major thing that was involved, and also, you know, what the league wanted called, and there'd be a morning meeting uh, at 11 a.m. before every game, and there were certain things that they wanted you to crack down on, and I would take that and, you know, consider who was in the game and who they wanted those things cracked down on and know that it was going to put a team at a disadvantage. So I would also take that into effect. Okay, so early on, when you first started betting, it's not like you could walk into um, Atlantic City, walk up to the sports betting booth and say, Hi, <laughs> I'm Tim. I'm a ref of the NBA. I want to put $10,000 on tonight's game that I'm actually playing in. Uh, so how were you actually doing in the beginning? You know, I had a friend, uh, you know, Jack and Cannon, who we were betting on everything together. Uh, baseball, basketball, football, and I would give him the picks and he was placing the bets. Okay, did you feel that that was safe enough at that point for you? Uh, I always told him, you know, don't don't place the bets through a guy named Pete Ruggieri, who was a guy that knew us both. He told me he wasn't, but, you know, I found out that he was and that guy was able to piece things together that um, Jack all of a sudden started winning a high number of NBA games and what he started to do was piggyback the bets and bet hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, off of whatever Jack was betting.
you know, when it comes to these these sports betting organizations, they're not trying to lose their shirt. So when they start to see certain people and instead of 56, 57 percent, they're winning 75, 80 percent. Was there alarms that was being set off in that community? Uh, definitely. I think when I, you know, think back and, and you know, as, even though I told Jack not to bet through Pete, uh, he was betting through Pete. And obviously Pete wasn't stupid. He saw the, you know, Jack probably winning not even 50 percent of the time and all of a sudden winning 80 percent of the time knowing that we were very good friends, knowing that the games he was winning, um, a lot majority of them were games that I was officiating. So uh, he was able to put two and two together and, you know, make, you know, millions of dollars himself doing it. Okay, so that next year, 2004, uh, you were actually refereeing the uh, Malice in the Palace. Right. Tell me about that game. You know, it was a game where Indiana and Detroit – had had a rivalry that was getting heated, and we had a game, I think it was on TNT, and near the end of the game, it was decided that, um, you know, I think uh, Indiana had won, and there was a meaningless foul that was taken, and free throws were being shot, and Ron Artest, uh, you know, had gotten to a little heated argument with Ben Wallace and went and laid over on the scores table, and somebody threw something at him. He ran up into the stands and, you know, a big fight started. Right. I interviewed Ron Artest. And uh, during that time, I mean, he was huge. I mean, he had like just his giant wingspan of shoulder and he was tall and, and unbelievably strong. And I remember he ran up in the stands and just started punching people. It was, it was kind of insane. And then a whole brawl broke out and fans were jumping on the floor and getting knocked out. And, and it, was, it was a disaster. Somebody did something to me. I reacted. You know, I can't change who I am. Yeah. I can't change the fact that, you know, I had to grow up in survival mode. And then when I get older, if you put me in a situation where I got to survive, I will. It was a time it happened. You know, it was something that you wish you, it didn't happen because you lost a lot of money, but you put yourself in a situation. Anybody put themselves in a situation, you know, uh, they probably would have done, you know, would have done the same thing. It was unfortunate. But um, what do you think really triggered it going over the top the way it did because fights what, happen. What do you think triggered it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know either. If you don't know, I don't know. If you don't know, I don't know. If you don't know, I don't know. Right. Because <laughs> then even the fans started getting involved in it and everything. Well, was, you know, it was. If, if if nobody knows what happened, then I don't know what happened. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> what were you doing as this was happening? You know, we tried to break it up in the beginning, but then we kind of just stepped back and started taking notes and. I remember I was standing right near Jermaine O'Neal when um, this heavyset Mexican kid came at him, you know, wanting to fight him. And Jermaine wound up and punched him right in the jaw. And his back foot had slipped because there was water on the floor. And if his back foot didn't slip, I, I think that guy'd be dead. That's how hard of a punch he threw at him. So, yeah, there were fights going on all over the place. Okay. And... In 2004, you're still continuing to gamble and bet on these games. What changed between 2003 and 2004 in terms of your betting strategy? You know, nothing other than the fact that we probably started betting more games because we were so successful and, you know, it was, uh, you know, such a uh, winning percentage for us that we probably started to, to bet more games as I felt more comfortable, uh, you know, getting information that was given to us in the morning meetings and passing that along. How much money were you winning along the way? Because did you ever just say, okay, listen, like I am so sure of this game. I have such inside information that I know for sure I'm going to win. Why not try to get, you know, half a million dollars together? Let me get, let me take out some loans, let me whatever, and just go all out and try to really do it. Did you ever do that? I, I wish I would have thought like that, but, you know, Jack was just an insurance salesman he probably had limits of uh, $5,000 a game. So it's not like he was going to Vegas and, and doing it or, you know, going somewhere where he could bet a lot of money. The guys that were making a lot of money were uh, the bookmakers that were piggybacking off the bets that were betting overseas and betting hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, the, you know eventually the mob in New York was, was involved because Jimmy Batista was passing those picks along to them and, they were betting millions of dollars. So that's why the FBI got involved and the investigation started. 
Okay, and James Batista, he was a friend of yours from high school. Not really a friend of mine. He went to the same high school. He was a friend of Tommy Martino's, who was a, a mutual friend. Okay, and Batista, did he know any mafia guys himself? You know, supposedly he did. He was, uh, you know, one of the bigger bookmakers in the area, what they call as a money mover who, you know, moved a lot of money for uh, heavy gamblers. So, you know, Tommy Martino was basically his driver for a period of time, would take him back and forth to New York to have meetings with people uh, associated with organized crime. Okay, you're talking about the Gambino Mafia? Yes. Okay, and this part gets kind of fuzzy because some people say you sort of embellished this part of the story. You say that you didn't. Explain to me what the association with the Gambino Mafia was, how it started, and how it developed. You know, I'm not really sure. All I can do is tell you what the FBI told me. So I don't know how you can embellish the fact that, you know, they offered me to go into the witness protection program if needed and that Batista was involved with people associated with organized crime and he put tens of millions of dollars into their coffers and that's why they were involved with the investigation. So I don't really know how you can embellish that uh, to, you know, any extent. Okay, but did someone from the Gambino Mafia actually talk to you? No. Okay, because I read at one point you claimed that the Gambino Mafia threatened you to give them picks. That was Batista. What Batista did was, um, after Jack Tincana and I stopped doing it, you know, these picks were no longer being funneled through Pete Ruggieri and Batista and to the Gambino crime family, and Batista came down to the Marriott Hotel when I was in Philadelphia and uh, told me that he had been getting the picks for years and that if I didn't continue to give him the picks that he was going to expose me to the NBA or have somebody visit my wife and kids in Florida. Okay, but Batista, he's not like a made man or anything else like that, right? Not that I, I'm aware of. So he's just an associate of the Gambinos? I don't know for sure, but all I can, you know, again, tell you that what the FBI told me that he was involved with them. Okay, so when Batista approached you, and this is someone you've known since high school, and he suddenly tells you, listen, you either get back to work or else I'm going to either expose you to the NBA or I'm going to, did he threaten to kill you? Didn't threaten to kill me, no. Okay, so what was he threatening outside of the exposing? Send somebody down to visit my wife and kids in Florida. I don't know, tell them what I'd be doing, threaten them. I don't know really what, you know, the guy always talks in riddles. He's a, pretty much a moron. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, having someone say, do what I say, or else I'm going to send someone to go see your wife and kids at their house, that's, that's a pretty serious threat. Yeah, no doubt. Or even exposing me to the NBA and telling them what I had been doing the last couple of years. So either way, I was really screwed. I was going to lose my job, uh, have it exposed to my family. So, you know, I was just going to give him picks to the end of that basketball season and hope that the whole thing was going to go away. I mean, how scared were you at that time? You know, definitely I was not really scared of him, but scared of the whole situation. Okay. And this is where the FBI got involved because the FBI had a Gambino task force and they're monitoring a whole bunch of phone calls and wiretaps and everything else like that. And then out of nowhere, your name comes up on one of these wiretaps. Right. I mean, this was three months later. Um, you know, I was told that the FBI had been knocking on people's doors and we later found out that it was heard over a Gambino wiretap that Batista was claiming he had a referee in his hip pocket. Okay. So even though this happened, you know, it's, you know, when it comes to FBI investigations, they take a long time. They don't hear the wiretap and then just start arresting everybody. They're still building their case. So by 2006, nothing really happens in terms of your end. Uh, through 2006, are you still gambling and still giving out your picks and so forth? I am. This is, in, this is at the end of, uh, I believe, 2007 is when Batista approaches me in, in December of the end of 2006, beginning of 2007. So that's when that uh -huh. all started. So before that, I was always just doing it with Jack and Cannon. Okay. Now, now leading up to this, um, 
based on the investigation that happened, uh, there were some problems that were happening in your personal life outside of your professional life. Uh, they said that you had a notorious uh, short fuse uh, that went back to high school. Uh, you were described as a uh, loose cannon. Uh, there was a situation where you allegedly threatened a mail carrier. Um, you were sued by your neighbors for harassment, invasion of privacy. Um, you know, a neighbor said, uh, you know, that you were so bad, you can't imagine. This guy had a personality problem from day one with 99% of the people out there. Unless everything went his way, he just became a flaming maniac. Uh, the mayor said you were a very dictatorial personality and a very aggressive personality. Um, and because of this, uh, the, the, the mayor actually sanctioned- the, the mayor from where said that? The mayor uh, of your township. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, first time you're hearing this? First time I'm hearing a lot of it, but uh, I would agree with, you know, some of it. I do have a, did have a short temper and, you know, when I felt like somebody was, uh, you know, screwing me over, I definitely stood up for myself. And, you know, the one time was a situation where the mailman, instead of putting the mail in the mailbox, I didn't realize that we couldn't put our trash in front of there and he would come by every day and, and knock it over and send all the bottles down the street. And one day I hid in the garage to see who was doing it and saw that it was him and chased him down the street. I wanted him to come back and pick up all the bottles. And uh, he didn't like that and went back and called the police. Okay. Because of these various situations, weren't you sanctioned uh, by the NBA where they wouldn't let you uh, actually work the playoffs one season? No, that was because of a situation in uh, preseason referee meetings where Joe Crawford and I got into a fist fight and he smacked me and I knocked him out and I was taken out of the second round of the playoffs because of that. Okay, and Joe Crawford is who? He's a, another referee that, uh, one of the top referees in the league at the time. Okay, is this normal for two referees to be fist fighting? No, that's why I was suspended and taken out of the second round of the playoffs, but he was the top referee at the time. We had had uh, union issues and he was supporting one direction, I was supporting the other, and he smacked me in the face at one of the meetings and I, I punched him. Okay, so then 2007 rolls around, and on July 20th, a writer uh, for the New York Post, uh, Murray Weiss, he actually reported on an investigation uh, by the FBI into allegations that an NBA ref was betting on games and controlling the point spread. And it was revealed that it was you. How did you find out about this FBI investigation? I found out about it because Tommy Martino had called me uh, and told me that the FBI had knocked on his door three times and were asking questions about uh, mine and his relationship. So that's how I found out that the investigation had started. Okay. And when you found out about it, how'd you feel? Awful. I went, immediately went to a friend of mine who was an attorney and... Uh, I think within a couple of days, he had called the United States attorney who was working the case and uh, had a conversation with him. And uh, I was in the office and it was on speakerphone. And Tom Siegel, who was that United States attorney, said to the guy that called him, you know, you tell Tim Donaghy, we know what he did when we know who he did it with. And it's just a matter of time before we come get him. It's going to be a lot better for him if he comes to us before we come to him, because if we have to come to him, he's going to go to jail for a long, long time. Okay. So, um, I mean, once the news broke out, it turned into a circus. Uh, a bunch of reporters ended up on your front, uh, front lawn and, you know, you and your wife are inside. I mean, how did it feel when all this was happening? Sickening. I think I lost probably 25 pounds within, you know, a month. So, uh, you know, I knew not only was I in a lot of trouble, but, you know, of course, weighs on you that you have four daughters and how their lives are going to change so dramatically, you know, based on you making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year to figuring out how you're going to support them. So that was the biggest weight on my shoulders, um, you know, how I was going to support them. I really didn't think I was going to go to jail because I had that initial promise uh, from the United States attorney that. If I went to them before they came to me, that I would just lose my job. But if they had to come get me, not only was I going to lose my job, I was going to go to jail. So I felt if I went to them that um, I would avoid jail, but that didn't happen. 
okay. Uh, when the NBA found out about it, all hell broke loose. Uh, NBA Commissioner David Stern put out a statement. He said, we would like to assure our fans that no amount of effort, time, or personnel is being spared to assist in this investigation to bring to justice an individual who has betrayed the most sacred trust in professional sports and to take necessary, and to take necessary steps to protect against this ever happening again. Uh, he called the scandal a wake-up call and it said that we can't be compl complacent. complacent. Um, now, one of the, the U.S. representatives, Bobby Rush of Illinois, uh, he asked to meet with Stern in regards to you. And in a letter, uh, you know, he said that he potentially wants to do a hearing should the facts warrant public scrutiny. He also said that the affair could potentially be one of the most damaging scandals in the history of American sports. Was there an official hearing uh, in Congress over this? No, uh, we had thought that there was going to be one, but... You know, David Stern had so much power that he was able to really get this whole thing squashed and, uh, you know, say that I was the one bad apple in the bunch and I was the only one that did anything wrong. And, uh, you know, there was really nothing to see within their way that they, they were doing business and had a report typed up that said that they did nothing wrong, but they were going to try and make some changes. And then it was all me. So on August 15th, you appeared in Brooklyn Federal Court and you pled guilty to conspiracy to engage in wire fraud and transmitting wagering information through interstate commerce. So your lawyer had already talked to you and said, don't try to fight this, just plead guilty to everything. I mean, was there a thought like, no, let's take it to court and I might possibly win? From his standpoint, absolutely. From my standpoint, no, I felt that, you know, I did something wrong. I was guilty. I thought it was in my interest, my family's best interest that I admit what I did and move on. Uh, and like I had said before, avoid jail time. But he felt that uh, there was a, a way for me to fight that based on the fact that, uh, you know, I just was doing what the league wanted me to do on the floor. Um, and somehow he might have felt that there was some law that, you know, would have saved me. I, I don't know. But, you know, to this day, he said if my mind would have been in a better frame that, you know, he felt that they could have fought that and, and we would have won. Well, right, because you're not a career criminal. You're not in and out of prison since you were 13. You've never done any jail time. You don't have a criminal record at that point, right? right? So, and you were facing five years if you were convicted in court. I think I was facing a lot more than five years. I think they were talking around 25 years. Okay, so you were just scared to death. No doubt. Point. I mean, scared, more scared than you could ever imagine. Right. I mean, you're uh, how old at the time? You're 40 years old and being told that you're going to get out of 65, you know, right when you become a senior you know, and, citizen. And, not, not the best. And, uh, that's, if I, you know, and that's, you know, I may need the witness protection uh, program and, you know, anything they could tell you to, you know, scare the living daylights out of you. I'll, I'll never forget Phil Scala, who was the supervisory special agent who wrote the forward for my book and said, I told the truth at every turn. The first meeting that I had with him. He stood up and stuck his finger across this table right in my face. And he said, you know, you're sitting in the same fucking seat John Gotti sat in. I got John Gotti. You think you're going to lie to me? Fucking get up and leave right now. And, you know, <laughs> I, I knew I was cooked at that point. Okay. So you decided to fully cooperate. 100%. Now. Did the mafia threaten you at that point? Because now you're implicating them as well. No, I mean, I never got threatened again, really, till I was in jail one time and a guy who claimed to be associated with the uh, mafia, you know, was coming after me. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But during this time, no one reached out to you and said, listen, it'd be better if you be quiet, if you want your family to be safe or if you want to be safe. No, at that point, once I started to cooperate, I had police out in front of my house 24-7, I was in constant contact with the FBI. So really, there was going to be no way anybody at that point could have got to me. Okay, so now you're cooperating. And they talked about the whole system because it's not like you were just calling people up and said, hey, the Lakers game, or tonight, the Lakers game is tonight. Uh, bet on the Lakers. Uh, put as much money into it. Like you were actually using code words and, and everything else like that. Right. When I would call Tommy at that point when he was placing the bets and transferring the information to Batista. We used a code. He had two brothers. 
One lived near him, one li lived in New Jersey, and one brother was the home team and another brother was the away team. So that's how I would communicate the picks to him uh, so that he could pass them along to Batista. And every time that you had a correct pick, you would get $2,000? Uh, $2,000, yes. Okay. And then at one point, it went up to $5,000? We never really got paid that at the end. Batista, you know, ended up keeping a lot of the money. I think I ended up getting about $30,000 from uh, Martino through Batista at that point. So um, Batista had drug issues. He had a, a issue with gambling online that he had lost a lot of the money that, you know, we were supposed to get. And then when the investigation started, we never had contact again. Okay. And they said that you made around 300000 total. Is that accurate? No, not even close. I think with uh, Martino and Batista, somewhere around $30,000 I had to pay back to the government. And with Jack and Cannon over three years, you know, we had won a lot. We had lost a lot on other sports. You know, who knows, maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So, you know, under $100,000 for sure. I mean, doesn't that kind of sound like a waste of time? I mean, you're making 300000 a year and you're risking your career and your freedom over something that's even less than your salary, way less than your salary. Hey, if I could turn back time, pal, I'd be the first one to do it. Trust me, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I made a lot of good choices because I definitely didn't. Okay. Well, uh, at one point, uh, Andrew Thomas, he was a former uh, county attorney uh, in Arizona. He asked if the NBA, he asked the NBA and the FBI if you intentionally miscalled two Phoenix Suns games. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. So what's the deal with that? You know, I think that each individual team wanted to know how bad uh, this, uh, you know, affected their home team and did it affect them winning a, a ring at one point. So, um, you know, they wanted the whole thing exposed. They didn't want the NBA to be able to cover it up. And, and they wanted to know to the extent of, you know, what I did, how it affected them. Okay. And what did they find? You know, the, through the NBA doing their own investigation, um, they found that there was never calls in games that I made that, uh, you know, directed the outcome of, of having a different team win it. So um, the, the FBI and the NBA did their own independent investigations and found that I had just made calls in the games that were directed, uh, you know, by the league for me to do. Okay, so this really created a lot of change in the NBA. So... Based on the labor agreements, refs aren't allowed to do most forms of gambling, but they said that about half of the referees made bets in casinos, but not on sports books. And they said that almost all referees said they did some sort of gambling. So Stern said that a ban on gambling is absolute, and in my view, it's too absolute, too harsh, and it was not particularly well enforced over the years. Um, the gambling rules were revised to allow referees to engage in some form of gambling, but not on sports. Uh, there are a few other referee-related rules change. Um, you know, it was announced that referees, uh, that the referees that were calling a game was moved from 90 minutes before the tip-off to the morning of the game to reduce the value of information to gamblers. Uh, referees received more in-season training and counseling on gambling. There were more background checks. And they also said that they were going to analyze the statistical relationship between the referees and the actual games. Uh, based on these changes, were these real changes or was it just fluff for the media? I think it was a lot of fluff. I mean, when he stood up there at the podium and said, uh, you know, NBA referees aren't allowed to gamble. Legal gambling will cost you your job. Illegal gambling will cost you your freedom. And then he found out that 50 out of 52 referees gambled, uh, you know, bet on football games, bet on golf matches, you know, went to the casinos. Really, he had to backtrack that. So he really stuck his foot in his mouth a lot uh, early on, which he would have been better off just waiting uh, to see what the outcome of everything was instead of just going up there and trying to point the finger at me and uh, act like I was the only one that ever gambled. I was the only one that, you know, uh, was involved in, uh, being in the locker room and and talking about sticking it to players or coaches or you know doing things out on the floor that shouldn't have been done. So uh, you know, really, he stuck his foot in his mouth a lot when it came to that. I mean, were there any real changes that came from this? Um, 
N not that I know of, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I, I think that there uh, should have been a lot of things that should have been done. I think you should be out there enforcing the rules as they're written in the rule book and, and not taking uh, into effect the, the score of the game or how much time's left on the clock. Uh, you know, you have to enforce the rules as they're written in the rule book, kind of like how the college game does it. Okay, so you plead guilty after you turn yourself in and they give you a $250,000 bond. How did you come up with the money? Um, I don't believe that I, I had to come up with any money, to be honest with you. I, it was, you know, 12 years ago, but I, I believe that they, you know, released me, you know, that same day. I don't believe I had to pay anything. Okay, so now you get released. You've pled guilty already, but you're waiting for the sentencing. Right. How, how rough of a period was that? Because you don't know. I mean, you're cooperating, but depending on the judge, they could throw the book at you. Longest year of my life, and the judge did throw the book at me because, uh, you know, there was a situation where, you know, I was preparing for Batista's trial, and uh, the NBA wanted this whole thing to go away because uh, Batista had a terrific lawyer in Jack McMahon, and he was saying that he was going to put uh, Tim Donaghy on the stand, and he was going to ask him about every referee and what they did on and off the floor. And he was going to put every other referee and every other owner on the stand. And I think he really shook up the NBA to the point where they were in uh, bed with the prosecuting attorney. And, uh, you know, they gave Batista a sweetheart deal because this was his third offense. He had already been to jail twice. So, you know, he really should have probably went to jail for 10 or 15 years. And he got the same amount of time that I got, which, you know, my attorney thought was, you know, ridiculous. The NBA hates you at this point, and they went after you. They wanted to get reimbursed for all the costs, the airfare, the meals, the complimentary game tickets, and all other expenses, including $750 in shoes. So they felt that you owe them $1.4 million, which includes $577,000 of your pay and benefits for all four seasons plus all the legal fees and all the expenses for the internal investigations. Uh, when you heard that, what'd you think? You know, thinking back when I heard it, I didn't even care because, you know, I, I felt like my life was ruined and, and I was never going to recover from it. But my attorney was smart enough to get that reduced, I think, to about $200,000. And it was joint and several with Martino and Batista. So um, I eventually ended up paying that off myself even though it was joint and several. I don't know if you're familiar with what that means, but we're all responsible for it. Whoever has it, they'll take it from. And, um, you know, I ended up paying it off for the three of us. So, um, you know, I was lucky enough that my attorney had gotten that reduced to uh, a managing um, portion when I had become successful again. So I, I just let them, you know, take it from me. Well, right. Uh, your lawyer felt that the league was trying to retaliate against you. Um, your lawyer said they should only apply to one season, you know, not all four seasons like they were trying to do. And um, not only that, and, if I could interrupt you, I apologize. No, you know, the, the judge no, was, you know, so pro NBA. I was taking my salary over 12 months. So when this all went down, the NBA stopped paying me. So I had another six months of salary due. And even though I wasn't paid that, she made me pay that back. She wouldn't do the math and deduct that off of the fact that I never got it. She wouldn't listen to my attorney. She wouldn't let him, you know, he tried to spell it out for her three different times. And she was just so pro NBA that she added that on, even though I never received it. Well, at one point it seemed like your attorney started to go after the NBA. So, uh, your attorney filed a court document alleging, uh, among other things, that Game 6 of the 2002 Western Conference Finals between the Lakers and the Kings had been fixed by two different referees. In the letter, it said that you learned from referee A that referee A and F wanted to extend the series to seven games. Uh, you knew referees A and F to be company men, always acting in the interest of the NBA, and that night it was the NBA's interest to add another game to the series. Uh, the Lakers won Game 6. Uh, attempting 18 more free throws than the Kings in the fourth quarter, and it went and they went on to win the 2002 NBA Finals. Now, even though the teams weren't named, but the only conference finals that were a seven-game series were the teams that I just mentioned. 
Right, it was the Lakers and the Kings, and I'm not sure. I guess he wanted to put a puzzle together and and have stir up more controversy by having the media figure out who it was. But no doubt, Delaney and Dick Bavetta, especially Bavetta, was a guy that said he was put on certain game sixes to make sure a team won, so there'd be a game seven, which was great for the league, great for TV, and great for global attention. So, uh, you know, there's no doubt that Bavetta not only said that to me, but said it to many other referees. And uh, he was a guy that, you know, he felt the NBA used to make certain things happen. And he would go out there and make calls in games, whether they were right or wrong, to get an outcome that uh, was best for the league. Well, right. Uh, your lawyer said the top executives of the NBA sought to manipulate games using referees. It also said the NBA officials would tell referees not to call technical fouls on certain players and say the referee was privately reprimanded by the league for ejecting a star player in the first quarter of the January 2000 game. Uh, who was that star player? Uh, it was Gary Payton. It was a game in New York, and Ted Bernhardt, uh, you know, ejected him, and he got a lot of heat for doing it because they said Gary Payton goes into New York once a year. He's a star player. People paid a lot of money to sit in those courtside seats to see him play. We don't want him ejected in the first quarter. We don't care what he says to you. And, uh, you know, that was a message that, you know, floated down through uh, the officiating staff, you know, not to do something like that because of the amount of money people pay to see these stars play. Well, uh, the feds investigated this, found no evidence to support it. Uh, Stern actually spoke on this and he called you a singing cooperating witness and said this was all false. Yeah, well, David Stern's a little fat stutter and prick and there's no doubt that everything that he did and said was a complete lie because Phil Scala, who was the FBI supervisory special agent, wrote the forward for my book, said I told the truth at every turn, and all those stories, or most of them that we discussed, are in my book. And he read the entire book and wrote the forward for it. So, you know, I think David Stern, uh, obviously, uh, you know, is a liar, and the majority of the world knows that he's a liar and, and knows that a lot of the things he said and did in regard to this whole situation was a bunch of bullshit. Well, then we get to the sentencing. How did you feel leading up to this? You know, exhausted, uh, you know, a, a sense of relief knowing that I was going to uh, finally see what my fate was and not in my wildest dreams did I, you know, think that I was going to go to jail, but Martino and Batista were sentenced ahead of me and Martino got a year and a day and Batista got 15 months. So I knew, you know, I was most likely going to get somewhere, uh, you know, in between what they got. Right. You got 15 months in prison. Yes. When you heard that, what'd you think? You know, just wanted to get it started, you know, relieved that, you know, I knew what my fate was and, you know, it started to be a situation where, you know, things were going to be behind me after I started to go to federal prison and, and got that year and a half behind me. Okay. And your lawyer tried to get you probation, but the judge threw that out. Right. So you were also fined half a million dollars in order to pay 30000 in restitution. I think the restitution was $219,000. And like I said earlier, that was joint and several between the three of us. And I had had to pay back the $26,000 that Batista paid me through Martino. So I had written a check for that a couple months earlier. And then the restitution was going to be taken care of after we were out of prison. Well, in court, you actually apologized. You said, I brought shame on myself, my family, and the profession. Definitely, 100%. How long after all this happened did your uh, wife file for divorce? Um, probably within three months, you know. Uh, things weren't good at home, and she felt it was probably in the best interest for her and the kids to, uh, you know, file for divorce because she didn't know what assets the government was going to come in and take when, as you mentioned earlier, the NBA won at $1.4, $1.5 million dollars. And, you know, we were divorced and she ended up getting a million dollars in in assets and cash and uh, was able to, you know, restart her life when, when I went to prison. Right. And she had full custody of all four of your daughters. Uh, in the beginning, she did. And when I got out of federal prison, um, it was 50-50. And then eventually I received 100 percent of uh, custody of my daughters. OK, so how long after you get sentenced do you actually go to prison? I think within two months. Okay. 
and you went to Pensacola, Florida. Yes. Tell me about that first day. You know, nervous, scary, uh, walking into the place, not knowing much about it. Um, walk into the room that I'm going to be in and, you know, guys holding up the newspaper, USA Today, and it says, uh, NBA referee reports to federal prison, you know, acting as if I'm not there, just kind of mocking it. And, you know, it was tough because a lot of people knew that I was a, you know, cooperating witness for the government. And a lot of people are in prison because somebody cooperated against them. So, uh, you know, you're labeled a, a rat, which isn't really the label that you want when you're going into a federal prison. Okay, and a situation happened in prison. Right. There was a guy who claimed to be associated with organized crime and kept threatening me. And at one point, you know, a couple months into the uh, stay, he took a paint roller and uh, came up behind me and whacked me in the knee. And you went to the hospital over that? Well, the hot, well, the infirmary at the, um, at the jail. And, you know, I had since, you know, gotten two operations on my knee after I got out. Okay. And was it in prison that you started writing your first book? It was, yes. Okay. And this was Blowing the Whistle, The Culture of Fraud in the NBA. It, it, that was the original name. It, it was renamed to uh, Personal Foul because Blowing the Whistle uh, was supposedly uh, a term used for uh, homosexuals. And the lady said she didn't want to use that name. So we changed it from Blowing the Whistle to Personal Foul. Okay, and originally it was supposed to be published by Triumph Books, but ended up getting canceled because they were worried about getting sued by the NBA. Right, the NBA went uh, into the offices of 60 Minutes and Triumph Books and uh, had two attorneys go in and basically uh, tell them that, you know, everything that I said was a lie and none of it's true and, and not to have me on 60 Minutes and not to publish the book. And unfortunately, Triumph Books uh, let me keep my... Um, you know, payment that they gave me for it and uh, didn't publish the book, but I was able to get it published uh, after they dropped it. Okay. And it got renamed to Personal File, the first person account of the scandal that rocked the NBA. Yes. Okay. And a lot of people felt that there was a lot of false information in this book. Um. You know, in 2020, uh, an NBA commentator, Henry Abbott, said, I've never encountered someone who lies as much as uh, uh, Donaghy. He's so full of crap. Yeah, he was a puppet for the NBA. He worked for ESPN. And, um, you know, again, I hate to keep uh, reverting back to this, but it's the only thing that I can really think of is the fact that Phil Scala, who was a you know 25-year supervisory special agent for the FBI, wrote the forward for the book. He read the book and said, Tim, the only way I'll write the forward for it is if everything in there is true. And uh, he didn't make me take one thing out. And other than that, uh, everything else stayed in there. And he wrote the forward and in that forward said that I told the truth at every turn. Right. But later on, uh, you actually had to sue the book publisher, the book publisher, VTI Group, for breach of con contract. And you ended up winning $1.3 I think it was $1.8 million. And I did sue her because okay. she kept... Uh, a lot of the proceeds from the book. And then when I, you know, called her on the carpet for a lot of the money being missing, she tried to go to my probation officer and make stories up about me threatening her. And I sued her and everybody in their uh, office came in and backed me up and said that, you know, I never did anything that she said. And I was very fortunate enough in a jury trial that I was awarded 1.8 million. Did you get the money? Most of it. So, you got 15 months and you get out in 11 months. What was that first day like? Actually, I, I didn't get out in 11 months. I was, uh, you know, after a year, I was directed to go to a halfway house. And I went to that halfway house and I was having issues with my knee. And one of the counselors said I could go to the gym across the street. I went to that gym across the street. And one of the other employees from the halfway house saw me in the gym and said that I was out of bounds. And I had said, the other guy gave me permission. They went back to the other guy and he said he didn't give me permission when he did. They shackled and handcuffed me and took me in a van to the county jail and threw me in solitary confinement for 15 days and then threw me back in prison for three more months. Okay, so you did 14 months total? So I did the whole 15 months. Did the whole 15? 
So what was it like to get out after 15 months? Um, you know, fresh of breath air, you know, felt terrific to, you know, be out, but still a little nervous, not knowing what direction I was uh, going to head in. And, and again, how was I going to support my four daughters? Right, because you come out, you no longer have a job. You're definitely not going to be a referee anymore for any sport at that time. I mean, how are you? And, and you have a, a felony on your record? Yes. How were you getting by early on? You know, early on, uh, you know, it was difficult. I um, was fortunate enough that I had uh, supportive family and, and parents. I got a job immediately um, working uh, for a counselor of a gambling treatment center. And uh, I was doing, you know, odd jobs just to, you know, stay afloat and, and get started while I was still on probation and, uh, you know, just getting my life started again. I had a very good uh, support system with my family, which, you know, helped me get started. Right. And then in 2016, a documentary came out uh, called Dirty Games, The Dark Side of Sports. Right. And that was based on you. I think I was a, a section of it. There was a couple of documentaries that came out, and that one was, uh, you know, a guy out of Germany who did it, and and my story was one part of that. There was a situation in 2017 uh, over your daughter and uh, her being at a friend's house. Correct. Can you, can you talk about that? Sure. I had a daughter um, who was having issues with some substance abuse uh, my ex-wife called me and said she hadn't seen her for four days, and I started calling around, and I found out where she was, and I went to the house where she was. Uh, the parents and the kids were in there doing drugs, and she came stumbling out, and she was going to drive, and I took her keys from her and called the police, and then the father came out of the house and told me to get lost that she was with him, and uh, I told him I had called the cops, and I went up the street, and he came up the street after me with three other guys, and I told them if they continue to come up the street i had had a hammer in the car and i told them i was going to knock their fucking teeth down their throat if they took one more step towards me and the police okay. Okay. police showed up and um basically they told the police that i threatened them which i said i did and you know didn't think that i did anything wrong and they arrested me and threw me in jail for a night right you got released on five thousand dollar bond but ultimately it was dropped right it was dropped. And I, if you know, you asked me how I paid the last one, I paid that one with cash. Got it. Um, in 2018, the NBA started pushing for legal sports gambling nationwide with a cut of the bets. Did you find that somewhat ironic? Sure. I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, everything the NBA do does is, you know, revolved around dollar and, and making that revenue higher as they can and you know what they need to whatever they need to do uh they're going to do it and if it's taking a, a piece of the action of, of bets at every arena they're going to do it well right i mean because even some of the bigger networks like espn are they're getting into sports betting and incorporating sports betting into their shows and everything else like that so you kind of have this whole industry that was you know either illegal or based in certain cities, gambling cities like Vegas or Atlantic City, and now it's becoming just a mainstream kind of thing. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, my thoughts are that, you know, again, whatever they need to do or whatever anybody needs to do to make the environment around them better financially, they're going to do. And each individual state is going to capitalize on the tax dollar coming in from the revenue from gambling. So they're going to do it. And you know, take that money and put it into whatever they need to put it into, whether it's the school system or, uh, you know, uh, you know, handicapped uh, individuals that they can make the lives better for them. I think they're going to use it however they can do it to better the environment around them. Well, and then in 2021, uh, you joined Major League Wrestling, where you became a referee <laughs> for a wrestling league. And you became a heel at that. Right. You know, it was, it, it was a situation where, you know, I, I think uh, I was approached to be a referee and the skits were set up and, you know, rather than hide from it, I decided to, you know, endorse it and, and go with it and have a little fun with it. And, you know, I was paid very well for doing it. So 
Uh, you know, it was a situation where I felt like I couldn't turn it down and, you know, it, it you know, became successful for me. I mean, ultimately, you became the face of illegal gambling in sports. But when you look at what's really happening and what you've seen, what you heard, you know, you said you don't, you didn't know of any other referees that were engaging what you were doing. But I'm sure along the way, there are some players that bet on themselves, bet on their own teams, everything else like that. I mean, in, in baseball, the whole Pete Rose scandal happened which is why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Um, have you ever heard of players actually betting on themselves? Definitely. Michael Jordan has come out and said, or maybe he hasn't come out and said it, but other people have said that, you know, he has told people that, uh, you know, he was going to score a certain amount of points in a game that night and to bet the over of him having over 30 or 35 points that night, and, and people have done it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any secret that, uh, you know, Within the NBA family, there's a lot of gambling that goes on uh, between the players, uh, whether it's on an airplane and card games or during warm-ups, shooting three-point shots. There's a lot of stories that have gone around about uh, a lot of gambling within the NBA. Well, I mean, uh, playing cards on a plane is not a big deal. I mean, right? that's there's nothing really illegal about that. Uh, but betting on your own team to hit a certain spread getting to that number and then purposely not making a couple of uh, baskets, that's that's something different. Sure. Have you ever heard of anything like that? No, not that I can say that I've heard. Okay. Do you think it's really happening Absolutely, though? I do. I think, you know, when Michael Jordan was in that whole mess, oh, and that professional gambler, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, they had talked about different things uh, with games that were going on. And there's no doubt that I'm sure he probably said to him, we're going to cover tonight. There's no doubt we're going to cover tonight. And he was in the game a lot of times when he shouldn't have been. Uh, a lot of times at the end of a game, if a team's up seven, eight, nine points, they take the star out to avoid them getting hurt. And a lot of times he was still in the game. Yeah. Well, Tim, I appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Um, you know, this is just very much of a cautionary tale because gambling is so addictive. And... It's really not designed for you to win. Uh, when you go to these casinos in Vegas, that's all made off people losing. Right. You know, which, which is why I never gambled. You know, I'm like, I've always felt like it's, it's geared against you. And I think what your story has really illustrated is based on all the risks that you took and all the penalties that you ended up having, the rewards were just minimal. Right. It, it, it was you a know, mess. My I mean, life was a, a mess at the time. And uh, there wasn't a day that didn't go by that I didn't have a piece of paper with 10 bets on it. And it wasn't, you know, a time in the summer that I wasn't home, that I wasn't out on the golf course, you know, gambling for, you know, thousands of dollars and looking forward to jumping in a limo and going down to Atlantic City. So I could sit at that blackjack, blackjack table for, for 10 hours and feel like it was 30 minutes. That's how much of an enjoyment it was for me to do it. Right. But ultimately, you didn't walk away with very much money and probably lost money a lot of times. No doubt about it. I, and, you know, a lot of guys aren't able to recover the way I did. But again, with the support of uh, family and friends, I was able to rebuild my life and uh, get involved in uh, purchasing, um, you know, foreclosures from banks when I got out of jail and was lucky that in that Florida area, nobody wanted them. I was one of the few people that was buying them up and, um, you know, they're worth, uh, you know, a lot more than what I paid for them and they're all rented out. So, you know, knock on wood, um, one of the few success stories of somebody that was able to rebuild their life. And, you know, I can only hope that other people get that opportunity. But when you watch movies like Casino, one of my favorite all time films, the term degenerate gambler comes up a lot. Right. Would you consider at one point you were a degenerate gambler? As bad as you could be. Absolutely. No <laughs> doubt about it. It, it. Like I said, it, it consumed my life when I would be on the road. You know, I would hear that USA Today hit outside the door. They would drop the newspaper outside your hotel room door, and it would be about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'd wake up. This was before computers and everything, just to see what the lines were in the games that day. So, you know, I just look forward to seeing that every day. Yeah. And, you know, had you not done that, I mean, 
referees, you could referee into your 60s, right? Sure. So at 56, your age right now, instead of sitting here trying to figure out the next steps in your life, you could be you could have been a referee in the finals. You no could doubt, have had a lot a, of t- a bigger salary, yep. more more accolades. You could have progressed with your career. You were a great referee. That's the whole thing. It's not like you were a marginal referee and you were having to bet to try to supplement your income because you knew you were about to get fired. No, you were actually great at your job. You were doing the playoffs. The next logical step would have been to do the finals, and that would have put you in a, in a class, you know, at the very top. But unfortunately, you made some bad decisions and you went to prison and you could never go back to that line of work again. Right. And, and I turn on the TV a lot and see the games and I see guys that I came in with and see them running up and down the floor. And, you know, there's times where I feel sorry for myself and say that should be me. Um, and you talked about accolades of being in the NBA. The only accolades I want now is that my four daughters look at me and say, you know what? He, he's a good dad and he has recovered from this and we're all happy. That's really the only thing that matters to me. And you don't bet anymore at all? No. So no lottery tickets, no uh, no slot machines. No, definitely not. No blackjack, no. nothing. Do you ever get tempted sometimes? Yeah, sure. I mean, I like to play, starting to play, uh, you know, uh, golf or see, see my friends playing golf or, you know, see guys saying that they're going to go to the casinos. And, you know, there's always that excitement of, of going and, and, you know, watching or being a part of it. And it's just something that really – you know, you have to stay away from. There you go. Well, Tim, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I I wish you the best, man. You're still young, 56 years old. You still have many years ahead of you. Sounds like you're doing well in real estate. Um, You know, you stayed on the straight and narrow. You got four kids that love you. Um, And I think a lot of people can relate to your story. We've all gambled. I mean, I've gambled. I wasn't very good at it. I never got caught up in it. But come to think of it, you know, this is this is something that really affected my life. I had a friend, very close friend of mine named Leonard, in high school. I've never told this story before. So in high school, he started to gamble. And he started to realize at one point that he could make more money working with other gamblers. So he started building a network of established gamblers uh, where he would help them pick various games and he would get a cut and he would ex- he would explain the process to me. It'd be crazy. If it's like, if he lost a couple games to someone, he would call them back from a different number with a fake accent and try to get them working with him again. And then with that came the drugs and he started to go out. He, he dropped, he had people on payroll that were doing his tests. He got caught, kicked out of school. So then he moved out, started doing drugs. And at 23 years old, he overdosed on cocaine in Las Vegas and died. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And I remember going to his funeral and saying, I'm never going to try cocaine because of this. Right. And I never tried cocaine, which was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my Yeah, life. and one of the things that people don't realize is gambling is just along the lines of drug addiction and alcoholism. And I should have gotten a two-point uh, reduction in the federal sentencing guidelines for a gambling addiction And the judge wouldn't give it to me because that would have meant that I wouldn't go to jail. So it just, there were so many things that showed that she was just pro NBA and trying to put me in jail and and silence me that, you know, even the guy that was the lead United States attorney uh, for the Eastern District of New York, his name was Greg Andres. And he ended up leaving the United States attorney's office three months after my case was over, going to a law firm tripling his salary and doing all the outside legal counsel work for the NBA. And the FBI agents were furious that that took place and how unethical that that was. And yet that was all just sweeped under the rug and really never came out. Yeah. Yeah. When I look at my friend, uh, I mean, he died of drugs, but it started with gambling. Right. And, um, you know, that was luckily two things I never got into because I got to see how, what the worst case scenario was. So I just left it all alone. It was a cautionary tale for me. and But it just shows how it's all interrelated and how that fast money, that fast life, the, the thrill of gambling. I mean, everyone likes gambling. Everyone likes the feeling of, okay, am I going to win? Am I going to lose? But ultimately, it's a zero-sum game. It's, you know, People like to say that stock investing is the same as gambling. No, it's not. You're buying a piece of a company. It's very right. different. 
You know, when you bet, there's nothing that gets bought or sold or owned. It's just a bet. And once the game is over, the money gets distributed and you're done. So it's very different. So instead of when I think about gambling, I think, well, I could gamble and the odds are slightly stacked against me. Or I could put my money in the S&P 500, and I know for a fact over the last 150 years that if you leave your money in for a certain amount of time, you're guaranteed to earn it back. So why put your money in this where you're probably going to lose, whereas to put your money in that where you're probably going to win? And that's where I put all my money and over the last 15 years it transformed my life. If it wasn't for investing, I wouldn't be where I am today and I wouldn't have the peace of mind. If I had instead took that money and gambled... I'd probably be broke right. right now. Not a good feeling so, when you do. Exactly. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time. I wish you all the best. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Take care. All right, you Peace. too, bud.